Okay, so thank you for coming to this afternoon session. I'm here to talk a bit about our infrastructure setup and how we are sharing and distributing responsibilities in doing so. I'm Carsten. I work at the Göttingen State and University Library. I'm originally a mathematician, now I do IT infrastructure. And in particular, I'm the technology coordinator for the Daria DE Research Infrastructure Project which is a distributed infrastructure project for digital humanities uh, where we have 19 German institutions collaborating and there's also European collaborations going on. So it's a large heterogeneous uh, research project to build an infrastructure. So what does that mean? Research infrastructure as a project. It's all about closing gaps. So on the one hand side we have the developers, the researchers, scholars coming in with different research questions, research projects. And we have university and other data centers, computing centers. We have libraries and archives who have data, who have material that the researchers want to use for their stuff, for their research, for their particular questions. And these questions can be very abstract, they can be very technical. There's various degrees of uh, technical knowledge involved. On the other side, we have the bare metal uh, computers uh, getting power, getting network interfaces, extinguishing fires when everything breaks. And somehow there's a barrier in between and when they're trying to communicate, it's uh, sometimes hard uh, on all of those involved. So what we're trying to figure out is how to build some sort of black box with a lot of gears in it and a bit of rocket science and magic maybe. Um, Black boxes are always red, of course. Um, there's several infrastructure trying to do this uh, in the area of arts, sciences, humanities, uh, which are one of those is Daria, where, which I'm working for. And what we're trying to figure out is how can we identify or replace this red guy, this most important guy in the middle, which is trying to build this box, operate the box, and trying to uh, get this thing to work. So as I said, very multidisciplinary consortium. We have many experts with different skill sets from various programming languages and infrastructure management over to very uh, abstract research questions from the humanities. And the good thing is they're all together already in one project. We're all trying to work together to build this thing. Um, with the usual problems that come with research on, based on grants, so we have a limited time, we have a limited budget, and people have short-term contracts, which mean that at some point they're going to leave. Um, we have a very decentralized system. Uh, there's roughly about 20 services. We have test and production instances, uh, and that means the services that users can actually access via browsers uh, or APIs. Uh, on top of that, some actually require basic uh, infrastructure like virtual machines and so on, they can get that as well. So as a project, one of our problems is somehow projects always produce demonstrators, that's research, you find out something works, you write a paper about it and you go to the next problem. Um, but if you're building something that you then write your paper on, the users using that something, that application that you built, they're probably not happy with you just saying, well, it worked, so now I'm turning it off. Somehow we need to find a way to keep these things going as these infrastructure providers, as libraries, as data centers, as universities. We kind of feel an obligation to do that. That's kind of why we're doing it. Um, so when we started out, we started with everything being on their own stack, things running uh, independently from one another. But of course there were similarities between the systems, but everyone was, everything was set up by individuals. Um, they were talking to each other, but sometimes um, they did different things. So while some, some, most of these servers had, for instance, Apache running on it, the Apache configuration and the nitty gritty details like which SSL ciphers and so on, they were very different. Um, we basically had no documentation. This includes both software documentation and also how the machines were set up. There may have been some readme files somewhere or some wiki pages which were never really up to date at any time. Um, 
lots of snowflakes in the sense that uh, everything was different, everything was very handcrafted and uh, fixed in a very ad hoc manner. And of course, the usual problem, our test and production system started to diverge. They were around for a few years until they didn't work anymore. So we had these Java applications that were running once on the test system, once on the production system, and there was an upgrade coming. And they tried it several times and it always worked fine. And when they tried it in production, everything broke because some strange library was not the same apparently. Even though the same person set it up three years ago and never did different things on the machines. Everyone thought. And here's someone laughing. So I believe many of you know this problem. Uh, other things were like uh, our deployments took a full day and uh, these four people had all to be all had to be there in order to make it happen. Um, or we had those things that someone once built, now he's gone, now it doesn't work anymore, but we have to upgrade the system and it doesn't work anymore. Which means someone has to sit down and try to figure out what he did and why it's not working and how to fix it. So, DevOps to the rescue. Well, DevOps is basically a culture thing. At least that's what everyone always says. It's not about the technology, it's about the culture. We have to have operations and development work together. Well, I said before, we have a research project that involves both sides and also the third one, the user. We're already working together in some way or another, individuals talking to one another, but we are missing some of the workflows, which is infrastructure as code. And the way I think of it in this context, at least, is uh, basically that we're doing the infrastructure administration in the same way that agile development happens. So you're doing um, not only things like Scrum, but in particular, you're using the tools that are available. Also, we have the converse of that, that the development team is also directly involved with the operations, that they're in charge of making sure the system is repaired once it breaks. Um, so there's very different responsibilities on the level of the uh, servers on depending on what, what is actually the problem. So we implemented config management, Puppet in our case, um, set up a lot of in continuous integration, automation pipelines, all those nice things, and started working on consolidating our technology stacks, implementing best practices because all those developers, they're coming from individual research projects, many of them are working on their PhDs and they're just programming as part of that. Um, with what then turns out to be known as uh, academic code, which is not up to uh, what is also known as industry best practices, so everyone doing what they think is right, lots of spaghetti code, all of those. So. We set out to use Puppet, I mentioned it already, for the simple reason that it was already in use at many of our data centers. They were all using Puppet for years, um, to various degrees. For us, this meant we were going, that was five years ago, with um, current, well, then current, but basically still current standards in terms of abstraction layers, if you're familiar with Puppet, there's this roles and profiles pattern, which basically allows you to separate out um, the different applications into individual classes and decide which one you apply to which system. Which means that once we have an SSH, an SSL, an NTP and so on setup or a firewall one, uh, we can apply that to each of the systems and not in, so what we had before was that, for instance, for our authentication system, there was one guy who always had to SSH into each new machine to set it up because he was the one who knew how it was working. And of course, that doesn't scale very well. We also did a lot of work on harmonizing the coding and documentation styles uh, to make sure that people actually follow standard recommendations from the programming languages they were using also documentation on what we had needed to have in terms of documentation, both for developers, for admins, and also for users. Why all that? Well, I said it, uh, we can apply one of these profiles to all machines, which means a single developer who's just setting up his Java application doesn't really have to know how to set up NTP, how to set up the firewall, 
how to make sure that uh, all the SSL and SSH ciphers and key exchange algorithms are up to date and up to standard and you're not using very weak algorithms and things like that. They just want to change their application settings and because we've separated out each individual application, they are able to do that. They can directly access the Puppet code and directly change the things they want to change. In theory, they can change everything, but um, as it's a very small project with only like a dozen or so people involved uh, on actually maintaining the infrastructure at least, that means that we don't have problems of uh, people doing whatever they think is right. They do what they, well, they do think what is right, but most of the time it's actually right. Um, Reproducibility is much more our problem. So I said this, we have like 20 services, so 40 machines. That's not large scale. They are all different to some extent, but um, for us it's very important to be able to explain how these machines are set up, not just to be sure that when we do the um, test in development and then in, or in the test instance and then on the production instance that it will go the same way, but also as a scientific um, uh, requirement to be able to reproduce the machine that produced some result. So this means people share administration um, responsibilities. They only manage their uh, respective profiles and those get applied to all the machines. Well, all the machines where it's relevant. Which again means SSL ciphers, firewalls, and so on. You don't have to know how it works. You don't have to follow some obscure wiki page with instructions on what command to type in without really understanding what they're doing or changing config files without really knowing what each of the option means. Um, because also, I'm just saying, well, it doesn't really matter. It's just a development instance. It's a test instance. Uh, well, they turn out to be production a while later because someone's going to use them because they're going to conferences and presenting their latest work and then people start using it. So this is why security and compliance with uh, data protection is very important as well. So pros and cons is we all have it now codified in Puppet code, but that doesn't really replace documentation of what we've actually done. This is one of the important uh, things here, also there's the problem of if you're not doing Puppet all the day, or each day, all the time, um, it's much easier to just copy-paste something over instead of uh, doing some refactoring to make it work for more cases. So this is a problem we have to uh, constantly address. And also small changes, they become complicated once you start using uh, automation and config management. You can't just change a config file. Um, which is precisely the point. On the other hand, we have new possibilities like an, an overview of our infrastructure, what's going on, whether everything's fine or not in some cases. We can use some continuous integration. So Git pushes to GitHub automatically trigger our Jenkins builds, which then produce Debian packages we're putting in our apply repo, which we're then installing automatically on the servers, which we're managing through Puppet, with our internal Git uh, repositories and our GitLab instance. And we can use Vagrant on the developer machine to use both the same code and the same packages to actually reproduce the machines locally. Or not just locally, because in reality there's a second server, the production system, managed through the same code with a different repository. And there's a manual step involved in actually putting something into production, some of the software packages. It also produces a lot of new challenges. It's a much, much higher complexity level. We have many, many moving parts. Um, not so many independent systems anymore. We have lots of central things that are connected. And most importantly, we have introduced a new point for technical debt to occur. This puppet code, it needs to be uh, managed, it needs to be refactored continuously, it needs to be maintained, up to date, version upgrades, and so on. And as I said, preventing copy-paste syndrome um, to make it actually work faster. And in some cases, there's other problems. Some software is hard to automate. Uh, in our case, some of the systems, we saw, the, saw this 
that's earlier on that uh, puppet board screen. Uh, some of our systems have a thousand resources managed and some only have a hundred, which is then only the basic operating system and all that's actually running on the machine is done by hand, uh, which is something we're continuously trying to um, change one, one service at a time. One of the problems we're facing there is that we have multiple institutions, multiple data centers. Running all of that from one Puppet instance is not trivial because just because we're all using Puppet doesn't mean everything's compatible. Even if we're all doing roles and profiles, doesn't mean it's compatible because the actual implementation will look different. Uh, and there's always a fear that, well, someone else wrote this and we can't just apply this here. And then there's also some political issues. Um, Germany is a federal state. We're building a federal infra uh, national infrastructure, but data protection laws are on the local level. So there's 16 different ones. Uh, and for some reason, if a university user from Bavaria wants to use a service at a university from, uh, for instance, Niedersachsen, then the one university is not allowed to tell the other one what the name of the user is because it's only within Germany, but not within the same local state. And of course, then there's firewall, access protection, giving someone SSH access at a different university that can be tricky. Implementing it, actually talking to the people, there's always the problem of changing workflows, changing your the way you're running things, and it's always important to take everyone with you. Um, so I'll have a few examples of that later. What happens is that admins are suddenly tasked with doing development, not in the sense that they now need to learn Python or Go. Well, they may actually do, but uh, more importantly, they're doing development in terms of uh, what they're doing for the infrastructure management. That happens in the way of uh, development, basically. And conversely, the developers are also maintaining in infrastructure care uh, responsibly for production systems in some cases. So some of the things we learned during the process, um, we had developers who said, I'm afraid of the automation. I never know what it will do while I'm away. Um, that was in the very early days when he was setting up his application on his local machine. And he said, well, if I apt get install, that package, I only have to change that config setting. Why isn't it working the same in Puppet? You're also just installing the package. Yes, we are, but we're using an existing Puppet module for the web server, which is not the Ubuntu default, but the Puppet default, for the obvious reasons that it means it's now the default across all of the different operating systems but it's not the exact same default that that user had on his Ubuntu machine when there was a very strange config mismatch concerning some fast TGI settings which were causing problems somewhere down the line, which took us a while to figure out. And of course, that was built in weeks before it was actually tested, but it was only tested the day before they wanted to use it at a workshop and then it didn't work. Turns out it never had worked the last three weeks either, but no one ever noticed because they never tested it. Also the thing that config management, well, that's an admin thing where you do the NTP and firewall config, but doing that for something that's still in development, that was also a tough sale to some extent because people were saying, well, we're still developing. We, I can't tell you what the config file will look like in a year from now. For now it looks like this, but maybe I'll have to add an option. Well, sure, you can add the option there. But that took some time to convince. And on the other hand, uh, for administrators and, and operations people, there were cases where really Git, GitHub now, merge and, and pull and push, that's all so complicated, I really don't know how to do that. And also coding, my code is bad, I can't publicly share that with anyone, that's too embarrassing. And most importantly, if people know how we're setting up our web servers, they will know exactly how to hack us. Um, not entirely sure that's true, but of course there's a valid point of it. If you don't know what you're doing, then telling everyone that you don't know what you're doing is a problem. 
Um, but there are cases of people who actually publish everything. I think the UK government services do that. They just publish everything except for passwords. Um, as I said earlier, we have it internally still. So what's our main benefits? We have reducibility and defined state of our systems, at least of those that are completely managed for the systems. Um, we're now much faster in deploying applications because they all go through this continuous integration thing. We do have testing in many cases, not as much as we like. Um, any kind of contract management is still better than some handcrafted snowflakes because sometimes we had to replace systems when they broke. And it turns out if you can more or less re reconfigure that uh, from config management, it's way easier than just restoring some database backups and everything's back. We've also used this to harmonize much of the infrastructure. So whether or not we allow password logins or not, only SSH keys. Um, also the operating system we're using, when we started out we had everything from Slash through Debian through Ubuntu. Uh, now we've reduced that number of operating systems. We've also seen that when we start new projects, which happen from time to time, it's very easy to get started because they maybe use a very similar system. Because research projects, you, you start with something that was done in a previous project and want to continue on that. And then it's very easy to set up a system that's like the one we had last time and just start developing on that. We just do some branches here, rename some packages, and immediately we can start using the same technology for a different project. And of course, sharing all the expertise and to collaboratively build something that's one of the main advantages in this area. So sharing and distributing, looking back at my original black box, we have the cogwheels, basically the main problem of making things work smoothly, possibly. A bit of rocket science, Luke also said it yesterday, it's... Uh, can be surprising how many people don't use config management. Um, and if it really works, and if people are working together and collaborating, because that's actually the most important thing here, enabling the right people to actually work together with a bit of technology, then it can actually even look like magic to some. So in conclusion, it does take work. It does take consistent work and persistent work. But for us, it pays off because we had cases where we fixed bugs in the staging environment half an hour before our big workshop. And we were confident to just push the package over to our other repository and have it deploy within minutes so that we could actually do that workshop with several dozen people, I think it was in that case. So thank you.